I'm John Ferrugia. Welcome to Insight. We're about to take you on a unique journey that began in 2014 when this family home in Denver was the scene of a terrible tragedy that made national news and raised questions about the safety of marijuana edibles. A husband and wife lived in the home with their three boys. One night, only a few months after Colorado legalized recreational cannabis, a gunshot tore the family apart. Correspondent Lori Jane Gleha has the exclusive story. I didn't know it was my wife. A woman was found dead inside the home. I thought it was somebody else like this. We have learned she called 911 to report her husband was acting strangely. <laughs> That's the only way I could have done it. A man accused of murdering his wife while she was on the phone calling 911. I never, ever once thought about even hurting my wife or pushing her or anything. She said her husband was hallucinating and was scaring their three small children. Went alone, taking her life, taking her away from her three boys. Some people may wonder why anyone would drive 200 miles to talk face to face with a convicted killer in prison. A man who shot his beautiful wife right in front of his own child as she was calling 911 for help. But what this murderer has to say about why it all happened and where he puts the blame is important to hear. His name is Richard Kirk. Jittery, all worked up, you know. I understand. I've been through a lot. Right. Really this, has been, this is probably, well, man, down there's a complete truth and absolute. And that's why I was called. How come we're the only two that know about it, though? This was the father of three in April 2014, the night he murdered his wife. You watch those old movies and stuff well, like that. Who is interested in the truth? You, you only, me. You it's you only, and me right here. I, so far, nobody's been interested in the truth. That night, hours before he pulled the trigger, he ate part of a marijuana-infused edible gummy, which at the time was newly legalized for recreational consumption in Colorado. Okay. In this police video, he seems a bit confused when a detective questions him at the Denver Police Headquarters and reads him his rights. Do you have a right to talk to a lawyer before questioning and have him present during questioning? If you can't afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you without cost to you before questioning. Do you understand each of these rights that I've read to you? I was kind of spaced out. <laughs> Can we go over them? We'll go over them again? Yes. Please. All right. She was simple and but just simple but gorgeous on the inside and the outside. Chris Kirk had an elegance about her, beauty that seemed effortless, and a calming demeanor even during the most challenging times. This is Chris. To Erica Milligan. This is 1990. Chris Kirk was her best friend. She was always there for me. She always, she, she, I could text her or call her anytime and things would be great or we could say, hey, we need to go, let's get Chipotle, we need to talk. And, and it was just, it was a lot of that. It was just a genuine friend. The relationship between the two college sorority sisters blossomed in recent years, but Erica was also by Chris's side at her wedding two decades ago when Chris tied the knot with Richard Kirk. What do you see when, like, what do you see when you look at those two in that picture on that day? Just to me, happy. I think she was just glowing. As time passed, the two couples became a close foursome, often sharing family vacations together with their children. Chris lived for her role as a mother. Her boys were everything to her. I mean, from day one, that was her calling. I feel like Chris was born to be a mom and born to be a mom to boys. She could be the calm in that house, you know, uh, a really active husband, uh, three boys, a male dog, and, you know, there's, you know, Chris right in the middle of it. Everything's fine. Everything's good. How would you describe their marriage? I mean, the marriage wasn't perfect. I mean, my marriage isn't perfect. So it was nice to be able to talk to somebody about good times and bad times when you needed somebody who could relate. As typical as the Kirk's relationship may have seemed on the surface, police interviews with family and coworkers show a different side of their marriage and a dark side to Richard Kirk's personality. 
Richard Kirk suffered from back pain and an addiction to painkillers for years. He spent lots of money while the family struggled to get out of debt. I feel like someone ripped my soul out. Um, it's every day, all the time, everything I do. Chris Kirk's family declined an on-camera interview, but they previously spoke to Nine News in Denver, Colorado. We're not surprised that he shot someone. It's just we didn't think it would be a family member. We obtained police records showing Chris's stepfather, Wayne Conkey, also told detectives Richard always seemed like he was on the verge of being out of control and had road rage issues. Conkey also said he wished Richard treated Chris better. Chris's sister told the detective that Richard had a nasty streak and that she always had a feeling he was capable of hurting her sister. And a colleague reported that Chris wanted to tell Richard that she didn't love him anymore. Do you think they were about to get a divorce? I think they were at a, a down point in their marriage, but never did she say, hey, I'm going to divorce him or I'm contemplating divorce or I wish I could divorce him. That never came up with us. I also know that we're not going to know everything sure. about either of them because maybe she didn't want to say something because they knew she knew that Pat and Richard were friends or vice versa. The two couples were close and they were together on vacation about 10 days before Chris was killed. That trip would be the last time the four friends would ever be together. There are so many questions about what led to this horrible tragedy. Was this a difficult relationship that took a turn? Or was it possible that a marijuana edible could have altered the shooter's sense of reality so much that he didn't realize the person he was shooting was the mother of his children, his wife, the woman he married nearly two decades ago? Or could both be true? Chris Kirk's family sued the two companies that manufactured and sold the edible. The lawsuit claimed Richard Kirk's behavior and state of mind were delirious, paranoid, psychotic, and highly altered after consuming the edible. The lawsuit accused the companies of failing to provide any meaningful warning about the effects of consuming an edible and of negligently, recklessly, and purposefully concealing dosage and labeling information in order to make a profit. Both companies eventually settled with the family, but publicly rejected any responsibility for Richard Kirk's actions. And Kirk admitted his guilt in court instead of presenting his edible defense during a jury trial. He received a 30-year prison sentence. I still wanted to know, what did Richard Kirk have to say for himself about all of this? So we headed to Bent County Correctional Facility. We had never heard him publicly share his detailed version of what happened until now. I know without any doubt that if I did not eat that marijuana, my wife and family would still be together today. I know that with a certainty. We weren't allowed to take our camera into the prison, but we were allowed to record a nearly three hour interview with Richard Kirk. He looked a lot different from the mugshot I had seen in 2014. He had a gray goatee. His teeth were in bad shape, like he had been grinding them. He wore a baseball cap and glasses. One of the first things he wanted to show me were photographs of his family that he says he looks at daily, including one from that family vacation with their friends that happened just about 10 days before he murdered his wife. I miss contact. I miss, I miss the loving contact of my family, the, the embraces of my, my wife, the scent of clean pillows. I miss, um, I miss that I have absolutely no communication with my three sons. And I haven't since the night I was put in the back of a police car. At certain times during our interview, his face would quiver and he would nervously tug at his skin when he was talking about his family. He became the most emotional and even sobbed when he spoke about them. I miss everything about my boys. There's no one particular thing. I love them with all my heart. For the longest time, I've had this picture in my mind being released and walking out into the grass of a jailhouse and my three boys coming running towards me, wrapping their arms around me and saying they love me.
I asked him what he would say to his children now, especially the boy who was in the room when he killed his wife. I'd want him to know that I'm sorry that he was there. And all three of them, I would want him to know that it has nothing to do with them. Richard Kirk says his wife's death had everything to do with his decision to try edible marijuana without fully understanding how it might affect him. That was the worst decision I ever made in my life. I know that Chris knows that I didn't do it on purpose. I know she knows that. For years, Richard Kirk's back pain left him relying on prescription painkillers. He says he tried other therapy but kept coming back to the pills. He was an addict, growing tired of his dependence. And when he ran out of tablets between prescriptions in April 2014, another solution caught his eye. I see out of the corner of my eye where there's a store, a, a, a medical marijuana store that's been established that I've really never even noticed before. But this time as I drove by, it had a banner flapping in the wind and I noticed it said recreational marijuana. And I thought, I'm gonna turn around and go find out about it. And I turned, I made a U-turn and I went, and I went to that um, medical slash recreational marijuana store. Police released this footage of Richard Kirk browsing in a marijuana dispensary and eventually purchasing a 100 milligram orange ginger gummy candy. He says he was asking lots of questions during the 19 minutes he was in the store, trying to understand the difference between medical and recreational marijuana. I know for a fact that if I knew there was a marijuana product that the THC was not in, I would have absolutely taken that instead of the the edible that I ate. He remembers the moment he put a piece of candy into his mouth. Tasted good, tastes like orange ginger snap, but it had a little bit of a marijuana taste to it. Not much, but as I chewed it, I kind of tasted it more. And it went away, really melted pretty quickly, and, and I swallowed it. He says he waited an hour or more and felt nothing, so he tried a little more. I all of a sudden, almost instantaneously, just felt like this is a feeling I've never felt before. The THC in the original edible had kicked in. He says he started feeling really confused. He remembers jumping through a window when he could have walked through a nearby door. He says he scraped his shins and he remembers feeling sore. And then he remembers fixating on the address of his home and pressuring his son to recite the house number. He said, Dad, it's 2112, 2112, and something, when he said that number, something in me just, I just lost myself. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what the threat was. I didn't know if I was the threat. I didn't know. He told me he fumbled with the safe and doesn't know why he retrieved his gun. And then I asked him point blank, why? Did you kill your wife? Because I didn't know it was my wife. I thought it was somebody else, I guess. That's the only way I could have done it. I never ever once thought about even hurting my wife or pushing her or anything, let alone taking her life, taking her away from her three boys. But what about all of the things that people had said about him, that he had a short temper, that there were financial issues, that Chris had told someone that she was thinking about divorce? Was he planning to kill his wife anyway and just used the marijuana as an excuse? Well, first, I say it's 100 percent false, but I understand why they're thinking that, because all those things that you just talked about are actually true. Those those are normal things that I feel we were going through. I never meant to hurt her or take her away from her three boys or, or take her three boys away from her. Whether you believe his story or not, Richard Kirk insists the edible is to blame. And Colorado regulators did make significant changes after that incident and the suicide of a college student who jumped off a building after consuming an excess of edibles in 2014. For Richard Kirk, who may be sitting behind bars for the next few decades, more research and education is important. And if he could take it all back, his curiosity about the new marijuana shop near his home, he says he would. The THC in marijuana um, 
However, the delivery system uh, can cause in individuals uh, with or without a record of um, being diagnosed with any type of psychosis or any mental illness, I believe 100% that can trigger a psychosis in someone that is otherwise completely mentally healthy. I'm the one that shot and killed the person that I want to be with for the rest of my life and the rest of eternity. You know, the person is my soulmate. I was able to do that in front of my three children who I always vowed to protect and to watch over. I would say that the dangers are there. Are happy choose. Um, there's two individual taffies in here, so each one's five milligrams. Brandon Nowak is the general manager at the Simply Pure Dispensary in Denver, Colorado. I'll even advise people if they're really unsure to cut one of those in half. State estimates show about 6.5 million marijuana users visit Colorado annually, and the state sold more than 9.2 million recreational edibles in 2017. It's more about the education, start low and go slow. No walk has watched the products on the shelves change since 2014 with the implementation of new state safety regulations like childproof packaging and more overt labeling. They do have little THC logos um, on each individual state recommended dose of 10 milligrams. The state enacted emergency rules requiring each edible easily be divided into clearly marked servings containing 10 milligrams of THC or less with no more than 100 milligrams of active THC in a single package. That's the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. I don't necessarily agree with it. I understand the caution. I just think that now we need to really focus on the research and education so that we can start basing things off of facts and science rather than just this, you know, being scared of a new industry. Nowak says he thinks the regulations translate into extra costs and calories for high tolerance consumers like himself and isn't so sure the industry is safer because of it. He says cases of violence or death related to marijuana edibles seem to be extremely rare. There is no consistent method for tracking violent reactions linked to edibles, so we did our own digging. In 2015, an Oklahoma man shot and killed himself after ingesting 40 or 50 milligrams of edible marijuana gummies, according to a police report. A brief search of Denver 911 logs shows at least 91 documented reports of edible overdose calls between 2014 and now, including the time a tourist punched a paramedic with a closed fist after calling to report hallucinations. And this Florida man is now serving federal prison time after violently disrupting a flight from Seattle to Beijing. Court records show he ate at least four servings of marijuana hard candy edibles. With very few one or two people of, of negative cases out of how many millions of people use cannabis every single day and have for the last 50 years. I mean, basing things off of very, you know, very few instances is where I'm having the bigger issue. But Dr. Carrie Franzen, an associate professor of clinical pharmacy at the University of Colorado, says there is a legitimate safety reason behind Colorado's regulations. She helped draft the rules as a member of the state's marijuana consumer safety and social issues work group. I think that the best thing that we did was limit what was the maximum dosage that could go into any one edible product. Dr. Franzen says she conducted a two-year cannabis study in the Netherlands looking closely at the correlation between THC and symptoms of psychosis. Does everyone that consumes THC have the risk of experiencing symptoms of psychosis? I would say that there is a risk. It seems that the risk is increased with the higher doses and the higher concentrations that are achieved in an individual. Franzen says edibles are less predictable than inhaled marijuana, and new users should be particularly cautious. With edibles, there is a delay in getting the drug into the system because it has to be swallowed, it has to be broken up in the, in the um, gastrointestinal tract, and it has to be absorbed. That can take anywhere from 30 minutes to a few hours. And how much gets in can vary depending on what somebody ate that day, um, if they're on another drug, if they just exercised that day, how much fluid they have in their system. There's a lot of different um, factors. Franzen says she was able to block the symptoms of psychosis in a small study 
by administering an antipsychotic drug to her test subjects before they ingested any THC. At the same time, she says she preserved the participants high. How much more research do you think needs to be done when it comes to edibles before you're comfortable saying exactly, yeah, I know exactly how people should be using this? Is it just that we don't have enough research or is it just that this particular compound in our body's gastrointestinal tract are just too incompatible to, be, to predict what will happen? Not everybody that takes an edible agent is going to have hallucinations. Many, many people do take it and take it safely. And so we need to understand and respect that. But again, the risk seems to be much higher for edible agents than it does for smoked agents. Dr. Andrew Monty worked as a paid consultant for Kirk's defense team early in Kirk's case. He sits on the state's Retail Marijuana Public Health Advisory Committee and has conducted 10 cannabis-related illness studies since 2009. His latest research shows a surprising trend in the emergency room. There seem to be a disproportionate number of visits associated with edible cannabis products compared to other products. Monty tracked the 2,600 marijuana attributable patient visits to the emergency department at UC Health University of Colorado Hospital over the last five years. The number of emergency patients with marijuana-related symptoms who visited the hospital made up less than 1% of all visitors to the ER. But Monte found of those, psychiatric complications like hallucinations occurred at a greater rate for edible users when compared with patients who smoked the drug. Clearly, edibles seem to have a more severe toxicity than inhaled agents, and it seems that much of this is actually psychiatric in nature. It doesn't make sense to me to have edibles in the recreational marketplace. While Dr. Monty warns of the unpredictability of edibles, pot proponents say consumers have been empowered to use them responsibly for years with few problems. Did we do everything right, right out of the gate? No. I mean, we, we obviously had a learning curve that we, we've worked very hard as a state to make sure all of the issues surrounding edibles and, you know, product safety, making sure consumers understand how to use them safely, et cetera. We're trying to make sure all of that is addressed by our body of regulations. Rachel Gillette sits on the board of directors of Colorado's Normal Organization, a group that supports legalized marijuana products in all 50 states. She's an advocate of more research on the drug's effects. The studies that have taken place historically pertaining to cannabis in the United States are mostly studies that show how bad it is <laughs> or why, it, it, and we're not looking at the potential health benefits. The cannabis industry, as well as cannabis advocates, have been begging for the federal government to allow more studies that are more relevant to the use of cannabis, the safe use and consumption of cannabis than has ever been allowed. Gillette says it's unfair to link THC consumption to adverse behavior any more than any other drug, including alcohol. These are unfortunate circumstances, which is why I emphasize the importance of educating people on this product. However, pe drunk drivers kill people every day too. I mean, those are tragic circumstances. Does that mean we should prohibit alcohol? I think we tried that once, it didn't work. The push for marijuana legalization is growing. As of November 2018, nine states allow recreational marijuana sales and consumption. Oregon and Alaska have the most restrictive edible serving sizes at five milligrams of THC in each and only 50 milligrams of THC allowed in every package. And dozens of others are voting on or implementing new marijuana regulations many looking to Colorado for guidance. If there's one key thing that you would warn other states about or one key thing that you think they should know, what would it be? Understanding that industry uh, is uh, progressive and progressing rapidly and we see uh, a lot of development. Colorado's marijuana coordinator, Dominique Mendiola, says the state is frequently updating its rules to reflect the changing market. In 2018, the state addressed an increasing number of children accessing marijuana by preventing manufacturers from making edibles that look like tempting fruit or animal shapes. Required testing now checks for consistency and potency, and a newly created science and policy work group will further examine best practices 
and ways to collect important data related to marijuana consumption and its effects. I think that that is a challenge, the uh, consistency in data collection, and that's something that we have um, all identified as, as an issue and something that we need to focus on and expand on. Without more data and facts and research, it may never be clear exactly how the marijuana edible affected Richard Kirk or his decision to murder his wife, Chris. I think a lot of people are affected by the deep sorrow that people feel about what happened. I hope that they think about Chris and they think about the people that are making the laws. I would hope that Chris's memory would stay in the forefront. One thing is certain, the tragedy had a lasting effect on Colorado. As other states and countries move forward with marijuana legalization, many say it's important to examine what happened in the Kirk case to help understand how edibles might affect users differently and to educate consumers to make sure that the products are used safely. That's our insight for tonight. I'm John Ferrugia. Thanks for joining us. Good night.